her back. Chapter two. The answer. Now it is full day. In the hall of the hyperstyle, her back was, has awaited the sage since dawn. His impatience diminishing as the hours pass. Astonishing magic of the place. He came in as a conqueror, exalted, swelling ambition to the size of the edifice. Now the great bulk has disappeared, the columns too. He goes to and fro among them like a somnambulist, unconscious of height or depth. But it exhausts his elation. He becomes aware that he is waiting. The sage's absence begins to disquiet him. Can he have forgotten her back? Another hour goes by. He grows impatient once more, sees himself alone in the colonnade where priest and student, silent, busy with their work, ignore him. Little by little, he becomes aware of physical proportion. Physical disproportion. The enormous shafts crush him. He goes among them like a pygmy amid the work of giants. Yet another hour. His thoughts go round and round. Were not giants men like himself? They weren't afraid of size. His work reveals the craftsman and the craftsman exhibits luxuriant thought. Thought that evades measurement. What matters the pygmy? Her back lifts his face. Am I not heir to all that? With a thrill of pride, he sets himself to search for the secret meaning of the texts. An hour goes by, and head in hands, he gauges the darkness that lurks in ignorance. The sage appeared. Admittance to the inner temple, he said, demands absolute silence about instruction received there. It isn't enough never to repeat the spoken word. To interpret, to comment, is treason until you are judged to be established in the heart's intelligence. Are you ready? I hear and will obey. So may it be, Herbach, you are to cross the threshold. Go. The novice approached the main entrance. Great folding doors of wood worked with gold. The sage stopped him. My son, where are you going? Into a place unknown to you. Between what you will be and what you were there is a path. In every vital activity, it is the path that matters, for it involves all possible relationships of time, space and means between a beginning and its end. And unfolding of law through the means. The relationships may vary according to the means, according to the direction of the path, whose point of departure, material or ideal, is the door that determines the nature and direction of the way. This above all is what the sages have taught by symbol, inscription and the orientation of doors. Always attend to words that relate to them, for they are, in every case, revelatory. Our language is not vulgar, but initiative. A door is power, and it is inelocutable destiny. Power because it reveals the meaning of that to which it opens the way. Destiny, because the threshold once crossed, direction and meaning are imposed on you. The main door gives passage to the master of the house when he shows himself. It is an outward door that opens to two knocks. Other is the door that admits. The sage led her back leftwards to a low doorway hardly visible in the shadows. Here is the beginning of your path, a beginning proportionate to it. 
the way of knowledge is narrow. It allows neither detour nor willful complexity. The law is strict, the canon not indulgent. He who seeks the real no longer puts any trust in appearance. The sage studied her back's clouded face. Are you afraid of strictness? I'm afraid of cold. Coldness is the exactitude of the law, but life moves and fire is hot. You will choose the instruction that suits you on condition that you allow yourself to be guided in its use, for with every departure from rule you will slip into error. Listen. The teaching of the three masters is integral, each in itself. The mystic will teach you the joy of giving. The symbolist will awaken your intuition to the vital connection between things and beings. The geometer will initiate you into the properties of number and the becoming of forms, but it would be wrong to confuse and transpose their methods. The science of measurement gives knowledge of imperturbable laws, provided it starts out from reality and not from a supposition, a thing that only the sages or only the sages our masters have known how to do. All philosophical axioms, which are the very basis of theology, should be susceptible of translation into mathematics necessarily geometrical, for a mathematic that isn't expressed in geometrical terms opens the door to rationalistic hypotheses which lead to error. Mysticism consists in direct consciousness by confusion, fusion, a state of transparency that gives direct total vision of a harmony, not at all a matter of understanding. To seek this result by a play of thought and weaving of notions is to fall into the fanciful and erroneous. How can one achieve it? By abolishing screens that intervene. Until you reach it, be precise in your studies, avoid fantasy. Be careful not to transpose the procedures of the three modes of instruction such indiscipline turns the disciple from the path that leads to the subtlest revelations. The sage fell silent. The silence lengthened. Having weighed the implications of what he was told, her back spoke up. Master, I hear what you say. Dare I acknowledge a regret? If your science is strictly defined, measured and written down, I don't see what fields of research remain open to the student. Overweening, Chick P still imposes his presence on her back. Let her back open his heart and his ears. Write down, or written down or not, Truth stands forever, whereas your spirit is incarnate in you but for a time. It came to acquire consciousness of all this. What matters is the growth of your consciousness, which is the relation between personal you and the causal power. Don't be anxious. Each truth you learn will be, for you, as new as if it had never been written. It will always have the importance of a discovery through its resonance, through your own number and particular function in cosmos. For this is particular to each student, as well as his use of acquired consciousness in his private life. The disciple bowed low, I understand. At a given signal, the door opened from within. The sage embraced her back. Go in then, my son, and may your destiny be fulfilled. Shaking all over, 
her back crossed the threshold under the eyes of a keeper who closed the heavy door. We enter an inner world, said the sage, where all the mysteries of the word are at work. The word whose face, her, is a mirror. Your own face, her back, opens to the outer world by seven doors. Three are double, opening eastward and westward. The seventh is one and central, yet it has a double interior canal with double function. The air of Shu bathes them all equally, but each takes from this same air, by adaptation, a different quality. The eyes, are T, receive Shu's light. The nostrils, Shu, T, breathe his air. The central door, the mouth, Ra, has a dual function to admit offerings of food and to let the master of the house, the active word, emerge and show himself. Each door is specialised as to name and function. But the central door is known by the generic name of Ra, opening entry. Note that the I, R, T, the nostril, Sher, T, and the ear, Mesger, have the same letter R. You must learn the meaning of each door, and if you want to know where it leads you, study its form, name, place, and symbolism, and it will tell you its function. Master, did you forget to speak of the ear that hears all shoes voices? The master knows when he leaves something out. You can speak of Shu's air, his light, his shadow, his dryness, because Shu is a primordial elemental netter, that is to say, with his twin Tefnut, without whom he couldn't have existed. He contains the four constitutive qualities of the world, but he causes the manifestation of the word which becomes word, voice, keru, all the voices of nature. That is why the ears are said to be living, for they are doors that receive him. Shyly, her back expressed surprise. But haven't I heard this about Amon? Shu is imminent in perpetual creation as primordial principle. His name evokes air and space. His symbol, a feather, is light and undivided, while Amon's is rigid, dual, divided into compartments, coloured and pervades the sky. For the universal netter, Amon, whose nature and power are likewise aerial, containing the four qualities of Shu and Tefnut, is essentially the generative environment of being in cosmos. The name Amon is that of an aerial water that carries in itself the principle of stability, while Shu gives our atmosphere its qualities of fire, light and air, the generation of a being in the world is surrounded by the amniotic water of Amon like a fetus in the womb. The disciple didn't hide his feelings. Master, I'm hardly through the first door and already so many symbols are shown me, but I still don't know where I am. This is the entrance to the inner temple, said the sage. In this hall, offerings received in the hall leading to it are consecrated. Her back considered the strong columns, the altar table, 
the dresses for offerings and various articles used in the rite. I don't understand the principle of the offering, he said. If the netters are the powers that rule nature, they don't need what is brought to them. They don't need it, said the sage, but man needs them. Don't let your be- don't let yourself be deceived by a too facile confusion of the abstract. Causal netters with the concrete form in which they have had to be depicted so as to avoid the mistaken transpositions an abstract theological teaching might lead to. As man is always tempted to invent gods in his own image, it is better to give him pictures whose hieratic style and peculiarities of composition exclude the possibility of sentimental error and interpretation of the divine in terms of the human. The netters are an expression of the principles and functions of divine power manifesting in nature. Their names and images, as pictured in the myths, define such principles and functions, and they are offered that the student may learn to know them and seek them in himself. For the netters are within you, and this can't be explained to the masses though an effective right may awaken consciousness of it. That is one reason for the offering. An offering made at the offerer's expense arouses in him the consciousness and effective desire of the netter's action. Such desire is a force of attraction, the magnetic power we call myrrh. It means a want, a need, a void that longs to be filled, This is the active principle of the sacrifice, which is based on the law of compensation. But there is a risk that you will be deceived as to the meaning of compensation unless you understand the action of crossing and the reactive force in all nature. You must habituate yourself to this mode of thinking if you wish to read the symbols. For we cross every idea. Bear in mind that every phenomenon is a reactive effect. That an active cause never produces a direct effect since it remains abstract, imperceptible unless there is resistance. When a resistance of the same kind as the cause absorbs and annuls it, regard this as a first crossing, that is also a death. But when the resistance becomes active in turn, as an anvil throws back the hammer that strikes it, the effect will be life, a life phenomenon, which is what we mean by the second crossing. Does the law of crossing as applied to an offering mean that the sacrifice to the netter should produce by reaction its effect in myself? Correct. As far as the moral magic of sacrifice is concerned, the practice of sacrifice is a defence of human consciousness against the deadly effect of the search for satisfaction. Animal man obeys the the desire of satisfaction as nature obeys the law of inertia. Now, satisfaction of a desire neutralises it, and this is a kind of death. Such is possession, or, oh, hang on a second. Animal man obeys the desire of satisfaction as nature obeys the law of inertia. Now, satisfaction of a desire neutralises it, and this is a kind of death. Such is possession of a thing ardently sought. The only active force that arises out of possession is fear of losing the object possessed. This is an egoism, constrictive 
which consequently diminishes more or less the power of its appeal. I see, said Herbach. Then the object in sacrificing the firstlings of the herds and first fruits of the harvest is to counter the possessive instinct that interrupts an exchange between man and netter. Herbach, you still seem to forget that the netters are also in yourself. It isn't at all a question of exchange as the profane understand it. An offering of firstlings, like all true sacrifice, arouses in the giver faith in the thing he desires or the power to bring it about, whereas there is risk that the effect of simple prayer will be compromised by the unconscious doubt it evokes by way of reaction in the man who makes it. Still, a sacrifice or gift offered against something desired is an exchange, said Herbach. Not as understood in the market, a deal in quantities but a compensation, according to the law of Ma'at, or the law of equilibrium imminent in Jewai's nature, as night, for instance, balances day, out-breathing, in-breathing. What troubles you is the confusion of various intentions in the act of sacrifice, the object of which may magically may be magically to awaken creative faith in the thing desired, to evoke the thing by desire or the magic of analogues, or to provoke its realisation by reaction. What is the difference between evocation and provocation? To provoke is to excite reaction in the thing, being or power to which provocation is addressed by resisting it. If you defy an enemy by doubting his courage, you double it. Wind strengthens the trunks of trees and the ears of corn by provoking their reactive, their vital power. A bone eaten by a dog or vulture stimulates the action of juices that facilitate its digestion. Then these animals run the risk of perishing if they are deprived of this kind of food, asked Herbach, attentive. Want of lime atrophies their characteristic digestive function, which is specialised for it. As to evocation, it invites actualization of the desired object by offering the thing, principle or idea that will act towards it magnetically, direct or by the magic of analogues. In the first case, it works by creating a want or void that becomes the myrrh or attractive force for a thing of its own kind. If you wish to drain a piece of land, you have only to dig a canal deeper than the level of the adjacent waters so that they gather there. The depth of the canal is your magnet for them. If your stomach feels no desire of food, you can stimulate hunger by evoking a favourite dish. If you plant shrubs in the desert, giving them water strictly necessary if they are to live, their roots will go deeper seeking water underground and their leaves will draw humidity from the air. In this way, your plantation may transform sterile soil into fertile. What will you have done to gain victory over the Sethian fire of the desert? You evoked the Amon Osiris functions of nature by offering Osiris vegetation. In the second case, evocation uses the magic of analogues, which is the intelligent choice of an analogue with the characteristics of the desired thing. Funeral offerings are made in the form of flowers in elongated bouquets, as if by some freak of growth they sprang from one to the other. You evoke by analogy that what you wish for the dead. The flower bears seed. The symbol or analogy of such bouquets is the re-arising of life that no longer depends on earth. 
It even happens that the mummy's image is given excessive height to accentuate and intensify the symbol's power. Doesn't this say the same thing as the prayer so often repeated in our texts? May your name flower again. The master approved. This is true. Funeral ceremonies give further evidence of it in the dress of the mourners, whose robes and hair evoke the water of rejuvenation. Don't the myths confirm it? Herbach, Herbach asked. By depicting the resurrection of Osiris through the tears of Isis and Nephthys? Correct. Enrich your understanding with this other thought. Evocation by the magic of analogues has an aspect of which the profane are ignorant. The offering in this case is not a gift, but a symbol of what the netter invoked can give. Her back made a point. It doesn't seem that what is offered need be identical with the thing that is asked for. If I sacrifice a bull's thigh, it is because you need what it represents. To judge well of the matter, you must acquire what you still lack. Knowledge of analogues in nature, which we always use in our symbolic images. Begin by noting the characteristics of the thing offered. The nourishing flesh of a quadruped's thigh hasn't the same functional meaning as the forefoot, which gives the measure and direction to the power that resides in the thigh. Learn also to distinguish the gestures of the arms and hands of the one who makes the offering or performs the rite. An arm held up offers an emblem of what is desired. Hands lifted in opposition to the netter provoke him. The supplicant gesture of hands cupped to receive is an evocation. Consider without neglecting any one of them the details of an offering each is a word, each picture a book. Musing, the disciple contemplated the sculptured walls. Then each of these commonplace scenes teaches something. Can you doubt it from now on? In default of other proofs, wouldn't the meticulous care over details, their coincidence with the relevant texts, the opportune rearrangements of proportion in successive epochs, the strict correspondence of gesture with the intention of an offering be enough? But experience is the real proof. If you use our method of thinking in the consideration of the themes, their true value lies in an integral correspondence with the laws of nature that gives them the character of universality. If you discern the principle that a picture interprets, you will be able to explain what corresponds with it in the becoming of chick or fetus or of man or a being in the duat, on condition that you are not mistaken as to what phase is symbolised. Master of Wisdom, I have seen the whole meaning of the sacrifice. No, the sage pointed to the offertory table. In spite of all I have said, you haven't grasped the most inward meaning. You passed the night before a statue of Tar in swaddling bands, and you didn't understand that PTH is creative force bound through the fall into matter. It is the cause of life, but it only lives when peace, hotep, HTP, or PTH, in reverse, releases it. That is to say, when peace or union has been made between the creative energy and what is to be given life. For there is a destroying fire in Ptah that becomes creative when this union is achieved. That is why Hotep is the word for peace as well as for an offering. Peace, 
Reconciliation between opposites is the most perfect of offerings. Peace in which the master gives himself in communion and becomes mediator. 11. Marvelling, her back studied the symbols the sage showed him. How can this teaching be secret when it is written in the words pth and hdp, he asked. Alas, man looks to the semblance and fears the reality. Master, the gift you have given me demands a recompense. The only thing I'm attached to is the jewel you gave me. Her back restored it to the sage. I tear out a piece of my heart. Is it enough? No gift compares with the gift of heaven, but sacrifice, pride and an offering acquires efficacy. I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> The sage places the jewel on an altar. He crossed his disciples' arms, took his hands into his own crossed hands and said, What Ptah made is returned to him that he may make peace, Hotep, in you and live in what he created. The sage was first to break silence. He touched the novice's brow. What are you waiting for, Herbach? Have you forgotten something? Master, I have been fed and fortified during this hour more than in a year of the peristyle. What is astonishing in that? They aren't the same doors. But were you not awaiting an answer? Or do you think you have had it? Master, I know you were talking about life when you were telling me about peace, but I still have everything to learn, everything to receive. Would you make me the gift of the promised answer? The sage led his disciple into a shadowy room, a lamp with a feeble flame lit walls covered with texts and carved scenes. A great image of Min presided. He made her back sit facing the netter, limbs crossed, hands open on the knees. He burned incense in a dish and waited until silence calmed the disciple. Then, in the serenity of this atmosphere, he spoke, grave with unusual gravity, asking, What is life? It is a form of the divine presence. It is the power imminent in created things to change themselves by successive destructions of form until the spirit or activating force of the original life stream is freed. This power resides in the very nature of things. Successive destruction of forms, metamorphosis, by the divine fire with rebirth of forms, new and living, is an expression of consciousness. It is the spiritual aim of all human life to attain a state of consciousness that is independent of bodily circumstance. What I have just said concerns the living spirit bestowed on the man already quickened, like every living thing, by a rudimentary soul, which makes of such a man a creature superior to the animal human kingdom. He who recognises the divine meaning of life knows that knowledge has but one aim, which is to achieve the successive stages that liberate him from the perishable. For things only die in their body. The spirit, the divine word, returns to its source and dies not. Unhappy is the car that fails to recover its soul. Eyes closed, her back took in every word of an answer whose importance he realised. When after long silence he expressed his gratitude, he no longer spoke out of unquiet curiosity, but in the certainty of a heart that has found its anchorage. The sage allowed him to savour the joy of it, then gave the impetus for a new effort. 
Don't be satisfied with the terms of my answer. The nut doesn't reveal the tree it contains. Bury my word in your heart that it may put out root and seed. Then return untiring to seek your nourishment in it until you have exhausted its substance.